according to your wish. Well, hi, and greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And welcome once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk. As we continue on in our look at the Sermon on the Mount, the most radical, fanatical sermon ever preached, and one that will bless us for sure. Amen. It's been a, a tremendous study so far. Bless the Lord, Lord. it has. <laughs> uh, we're continuing on. We're still in the Beatitudes. I think this is uh, about our, our seventh, I think, yes. session in this study. Mm -hmm. And I don't anticipate that it's going to end anytime soon. And that's a blessing too. Hallelujah. Because it's an in-depth study. And by the way, uh, all of the studies that we've done previously and all, as we do them, they will be up online on the Bible Talk site and available to be watched at your convenience on demand, mm -hmm. which means you can go back and review them as you'd like or invite others to come and catch up and watch what's going on in the past. Um, and then when we're through with the entire thing, we'll make the entire series available online or perhaps on DVD. Uh, uh, again, I want to remind you that we more than welcome. We really invite and want to encourage you to contact us at office at BibleTalk.com with any questions you have, suggestions you have. Uh, we, we, we'd like to make this as participatory as we possibly can. We're blessed to have this technology that allows us to broadcast around the world. We've been using it for a number of years now. And you can also access us on Facebook. On the Bible on Talk, our Facebook front, page. on the front page of Bible Talk. So, do that. But now, let's get right back into our study. But before we do, let me just do this. Father, we just thank you, Lord God. We thank you for your word. We thank you especially for your word made flesh who dwelt among us, your son Christ Jesus. And it's our desire that through this time in your word here, that we would grow closer, that we would, we would have greater understanding of your love, of your power, of your desires for our life. Lord, that we might go forth and be living witnesses, testimonies of that love and power. So, Lord, just open the eyes of our hearts so we would see wonderful things in your word as we go again into this study. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, we're in Matthew 5, 8. Uh, and again, the, the Beatitudes, we're saying, are these are the behaviors and the attitudes that Jesus has given us to live and walk in the righteousness that he gave us as a gift. Amen. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Hallelujah. I want to see God. I want to see him more clearly. Because when we see him as he is, it says we will be as he is. Mm -hmm. But part of the purpose of this, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit, I hope, as we get into this, is that in our daily lives, because this is a relevant teaching, this Sermon on the Mount. And it's important that we are pure in heart, because the more pure in heart we are, the more in tune we will be with the Lord, and the more we will see Jesus Christ in our everyday life, and know how to live that everyday life. And you, you must be aware of the other side of the coin, so to speak, here. Because if it says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. If we don't have purity in our hearts, we will not see God. That's scary. And that way, it should be scary. Mm -hmm. You know, it says, uh, work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. It should be a scary thing. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That, that, that we would have this great desire never, never to miss the Lord. Mm -hmm. Never to be in a place where we don't see Him. Let's start, as I tend to do a lot, in another book. Mm -hmm. The Dictionary. Because, as I, I like to say, and I think it's important that we do continue to remind one another, words matter. God watches over his word to perform it. He creates everything for its purpose. He doesn't speak idly. So when he says something, it has purpose and meaning. And we don't want to be careless with, with words, which is seeming to be a, a greater and greater happening in the world around us, and unfortunately in too much of the church around us today, we're careless about words. Pure is an adjective. And I'm going to just read from the Random House Dictionary and the Collins English Dictionary here. It's the definitions, all right? Pure is free from anything of a different, inferior, or contaminating kind. It's free from extraneous matter. It's unmodified 
by a mixture, an admixture, adding something to it. It's free from foreign or inappropriate elements. It's free from moral taint or defilement. That's the, that's the definition of pure. Right? So, our heart, by the way, is just, that's kind of a metaphor for the core of our being. That's where, by the way, that's where the word uh, core comes from. It's from the, from the Latin word for heart. Right? So it's, it's a metaphor that means it is the center of our being. It's our spirit. Right? We get the word pure from the Latin, purus, which means clean and unmixed. But the word that's used here in Matthew, remember this is written in Greek, the Greek word there is katharos. Now, that's tr most usually translated clean. Uh, but it happens to be where we get our word cathartic from in the English. And I'll, I'll talk about that here in a second. Because that's a matter of making things pure. Right? I want to talk about holiness, sanctification, and purity. Because those three words are to the greatest extent synonymous. Right? These are the things, you know, it says in Ecclesiastes that a three-stranded cord is not easily broken. And, and true purity is, is this combination, it's this cord bound together, intertwined of holiness, sanctification, and purity. Hebrews 12.14 says this, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Again, by the mouth of two or three witnesses. You know, for us to see the Lord, we have to be pure. We have to be holy. Mm -hmm. Holiness in, in that verse in Hebrews, by the way, it's, that's I read from the King James. It's translated sanctification in the New American Standard, which is what I'm using. Okay, So that Greek word is hagiosmos, which means purification. Again, those three words are intertwined. Holiness, sanctification, and purity. So, again, I, I just want to be really clear on the seriousness of this. This is a very serious yes, yes. sermon, all right? That without, you know, the other side of this is without being pure in heart, without that holiness, we will not see God. And we're living in very unholy times. So, um, in our, a couple of studies ago, we talked about, you know, we were in one of the Beatitudes, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And in talking about that, sat that satisfaction, that fullness, we saw that being full and being satisfied wasn't about adding things to our lives, because that's what most people are convinced of, if I only had. You know, it's about adding things. We're actually, in our study, and you can, if you miss this, go back and watch it. It's about what you remove from your life that will bring about true satisfaction and fullness in your life. Well, in the same way, purity is not about what you're going to add to your life now. It's about what you're going to take out of your life. It's not about adding purity, and because we'll talk about the fact that that, that purity was given to us when we entered into new life. It's about removing the impurity that we have allowed to come into there. Re remember, um, we've added a lot to our lives unfortunately. The world and the things of the world. It's like, you know, we walk through the world and we're just like a, we're like a, there's a character in uh, Charlie Brown, uh, oh, Peanuts, yeah. Pigpen. Pigpen. And it's like he walks down the street and just dirt, he's like a dirt magnet. <laughs> Sometimes I feel it's like, like that, you know, we walk through this world and it's like, <clears throat> we're just, we're, we attract all the stuff that, that shouldn't be there. Just clings to That's us. That's why right? we need the Holy Spirit. The oil Amen. of the Holy Spirit would just all that slide off. Which, on. by the way, and, and again, I, I, I hope I remember to speak about this frequently through here. Mm. It says that we've been sealed in the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. That's right. You know, because one of the beautiful things that God has done in our lives is that He has sealed us. And that's like if you, if you go to your kitchen cabin right now and pull out a sealed can of beans or peas or whatever, corn, to, okay, let's name all that. All right, boys and girls, let's all name. Okay. And just pour dirt all over the thing. It's not going to contaminate the contents because it's sealed. Mm -hmm. And that should be our lives. Is that the contamination of the world can't touch the core of our being because we're sealed. The only way that happens is when we peel back the top and allow things in. All right? All right. 
So anyhow, we have to remove anything that was extraneous. Remember that word, extraneous. Adding, extra, doesn't belong there, just not needed. All impurity is not about stuff that's rotten. There's a lot of stuff that's impurity, it's just stuff that doesn't belong there. It's not, it's not so much the quality of the thing, just the fact that it's not necessary to the life that God has called us to. Now, from the Greek word katharos that's used here, we get the English word, as I say, cathartic. Now, cathartic is a purgative. That's used to clean out the body. Now, the purpose of this study is that the word is a cathartic used by the Lord to cleanse our hearts. And, and this is very important because our purpose is love. All right? Always. Paul wrote to Timothy in his first letter, and he said, but the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart. Because if you have... If you, ha if you have what you think is love, and it's not coming from a pure heart, it's contaminating. And, you know, I've, I've talked about this in a lot of sermons I've preached around the world. It's like if you take a, if you're really, really thirsty, and most of us here in this country don't understand really, really thirsty. I mean, you know, Alice and I have lived in Central America in the bush. We've traveled in the, in the heat of Central Africa. And, you know, there are places, boy, when you get thirsty, you get thirsty. And there is nothing. Oh, it's so attractive as a glass of cold, clear water. Oh, my goodness. And I said, you know, wars have been fought over this over water. But how much dirt do you have to drop into that clear water before all of a sudden you don't want to touch it? You know, it's not like it has to be all dirt. It's not like it has to be all impure. It only takes a little impurity before, you know, you just don't want to touch it. Well, that's what, that's what we have to get to. We've got to remove all the impurity. Because love that doesn't come from a pure heart is like a drink from polluted water to a thirsty man. That's a fact, Jack. All right. Now, I, I just want to talk about this. And I, I, I'm going to share with you something that I had never really seen this way before until yesterday when I started preaching about it at our Sunday services. <laughs> Watch the timing here, brother. Okay. In, in Jeremiah chapter 13 and 14, the Lord is speaking to Jeremiah about the impurity of his people, how they rejected his word and turned to other gods in their pride. God is telling this prophet of the calamities that he will bring upon them as a result. And yes, God will bring calamities yes. for our disobedience. I know that's not being taught a lot in the body of Christ today, but it surely is in the Word of God. And not everything is the devil. Not, and not everything is the devil. That's right. So all of this is going on in spite of the fact that the prophets of the time are telling the people that everything is all right, everything is wonderful, and that they'll have a lasting peace. But the Lord says to them, I'm going to read to you now. This is Jeremiah 14. I'm reading verses 14 and 15. Then the Lord said to me, The prophets are prophesying falsehood in my name. I have neither sent them nor commanded them nor spoken to them. They are prophesying to you a false vision, divination, futility, and the deception of their own minds. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who are prophesying in my name, Although it was not I who sent them, yet they keep saying, There will be no sword or famine in this land. By sword and famine those prophets shall meet their end. I want to say to everybody out there who is proclaiming that they are prophets, beware, be careful, be, 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 make sure that you are hearing from the Lord before you open your mouth. Be quick to listen and slow to speak lest you incur the wrath of God. You see, these religious leaders of that time, and too many religious leaders of this time, they're creating a culture where impurity is tolerated rather than purged. Can you grow accustomed to the stench of your swimming in a cesspool? Well, this is... Uh, uh, the fact that the fact of the matter is, there are people who work in stinky situations. There are guys who go out and spend their lives cleaning cesspools. Can you become accustomed to? 
the answer to the question is absolutely yes. You can you can get to a place where all of a sudden you 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 grow so accustomed to a stench that it becomes normal to you, and you begin to accept it and ignore it, till you get to the point where you no longer even know it's there. Now you know I grew up in Midtown Manhattan in New York City, and you know I've shared this example a number of times. Where I was, uh, there was a constant blare of sirens and horns blowing. I mean, just constant. It's always there. Except for the fact that after a while, if you live there, you simply don't hear it. I mean, it's, it's almost like you have a filter in your brain, and it just becomes accustomed, and it literally filters it out and shuts it. And, you know, if somebody comes, uh, and, and they hear it, and... It's disturbing. And it disturbs them, and you're saying, what's the, what's the problem? You don't even hear it. I, I just uh, We have a clock in Alice's that, yeah. office, yeah. and that clock chimes on the half hour or an hour. And we've had people come and stay with us, and you know they say, well, they, they got they were, they were awakened all through the night, every half hour an hour, because the thing goes ding ding or whatever it does makes a noise. I don't know what kind of noise it makes. I've become a, I have become oblivious yeah. to it. My brain filters it out. I've we don't even hear it. We don't even hear it. Well, the danger is that we can have that happen with the impurity of sin in our lives if we begin to tolerate it we will grow to tolerate it more and more and more to where we don't even recognize that it's there. That's a grave and great danger. And, and the, the problem is, what we need in, this, in these perilous last days is good fellowship. Fellowship where you're around people, brothers and sisters in the Lord, who will love you enough to confront you when they see you in this thing, as we are called to do, by Jesus Christ, by the way. I mean, there's a procedure for this. So that we, if we're not, if we're missing it, and we all have blind spots, that's, that's a fact. Mm -hmm. But, so if you have somebody that loves you enough and they see that you're doing something that you shouldn't be doing, that they'll come to you in, in love and bring you correction through Scripture, because all Scripture is God-breathed and profitable for correction, for reproof. That's what Paul wrote to Timothy, see? And it's not, um them coming to you saying things because they think it's wrong. No. It's the Holy Spirit in them, in them. showing them that right. there's, you need to speak to your brother, you need to speak to your And sister. it has to be tested against the Word, Absolutely. and it has to be the Word that does the correction. Right. Not how they feel, not their opinion. So, but I, I'm saying, you know, we want, we should desire this. You know, Absolutely. David prayed that he would not reject the discipline of the Lord. This is one of the things, that we're going to be pure in heart, we need to, ha we need to have that right attitude. That not only are we not going to reject God's discipline in our lives, but that we're going to seek God's discipline in our lives. Because he said that he disciplines those whom he loves. And that's what it takes. We need to be purged of every impurity in our lives. So, uh, that was going to be the next thing I said, kind of. It's just, it's not only, not only should we be willing to go out and do that for but we should be seeking that in our own lives. Because I'm going to promise you, there are things that we have in our lives that we have that we have tolerated so long that we have become blind to. Oftentimes, when you see something in a brother or sister and say, "Oh boy, that's not right," what God's doing is holding a mirror up to you, so you see a reflection of what's going on in your life. And that's why, before you go to that brother that you see, the first thing you should Take do is examine them. yourself. Take the log out of your own eye. Uh, Take the log out of your own eye before you take the speck out of your brother's. These are important things, because purity should be such a desire in our lives. That's what Jesus is saying. This is the attitude that we should have. This is, this is the behavior that we should have, seeking this purity in our lives. All right, so Jeremiah, let me go back to Jeremiah a second. After, after God speaks this to Jeremiah, Jeremiah then takes and says this, and I love these verses. You know, in Jeremiah 15, where he says, Thy word was found, and I ate it. It became to me the joy and the delight of my heart. Oh, how wonderful. I mean, this is what the word of God became, what gave him joy in his life, right? And God spoke to him then and said, and this is Jeremiah fifteen nineteen. He said, Therefore, thus says the Lord, If you return, then I will restore you. Before me you will stand, and if you extract the precious 
from the worthless, you will become my spokesman. Extract the precious from the worthless. Separate them. Get them apart. Like Jeremiah, we have to expel what is worthless in our life. We've got to get the... You know, we, we have excellent in our lives. We have precious in our lives. That was a free gift of God. We were made right by the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. All right? But now, what we have to seek is that we separate the impure, the worthless, from that precious. goes back to that word that I said that we get from purity purged. A catharsis. We need to be purged. Now, at services this week, I was sharing that you know sometimes it's an unpleasant process, and you know this, this may this this ain't going to be religious, honey. This ain't going to be religious. You're looking for religious? Change the channel now. If anybody out there has ever had a colonoscopy. These are not fun. And you know why colonoscopies... Actually, colonoscopies are not bad. I've had one. You know why? Because they knock you out. What do you know? It's not bad. It's the preparation for the colonoscopy. Because before you can have a colonoscopy, you have to be purged. So they induce this purging by giving you something to drink for days before. And it's hard. It's absolutely hard. And what that does, I mean, it... it, it <laughs> It purges you. Yes. And that purging, if you ask anybody that's ever had this, uh, is, it can be, and I'll use the word violent, it's a violent purging, it, it cleansing, cleansing you out. Well, true purging can be violent, right? And if, if this, if this sounds a little down there, I want, I want to tell you something, it's really, really important. Because you see, your body, by the way, is designed to purge impurity. Has, has anybody out there ever been sick to their stomach to the point of vomiting? Mm, yes, yes. I told you this is not going to be religious. Yeah. Okay, raise your hands if you've ever vomited. <laughs> raise your hands if you've ever had fun vomiting. Not a one, no. Mm. It's, it's not fun. It's, it's not fun. It's horrible. And the, the, the more violent it is, I mean, what you're getting is a reaction to something that's in your body that shouldn't be in your body. It's impurity in your body. You know, it says in Psalm 139 that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And in God's perfect design, when there is impurity in the body, His, his design was that the body is going to expel it, reject it, get it out, violently get it out. It is the natural process, a good natural process, that God has created in His wisdom to protect the body is to expel that which is impure and presents danger to the body. All right? Here's what I, what I saw in a way that I hadn't seen before, just the other day. If you turn to Revelation chapter 3, and I, and I hope you're aware of this. Uh, I, want to, I want to show you how Jesus is purged. What? Is this heresy he speaks? Let, let me tell you something. We are the body of Christ. We are in Christ. Now, it's very important you understand this. We, can, we talk about having faith in Christ. We talk about walking in Christ. But the Word of God says we are, we are in Christ. This is what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. This is 1 Corinthians 1. Verses 30 and 31. By his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Okay? We're in Christ Jesus. Now, in Revelation chapter 3, Jesus, who is perfect in holiness, who is perfect in purity, yet when impurities are in his body, or because if any impurity gets into his body, it must be purged. Right? So if you know the, the, the letter to the church at Laodicea, 
The church of Laodicea has, God has no, nothing good to say to This is a church fully and totally compromised in their lives. In, in Revelation 3.14, I'm going to start there, it says, To the angel of the church at Laodicea write, The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither hot, cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now the New American Standard says spit. The King James says spew. But that's because we're silly little Christians who don't want to offend anybody's sensibilities. And we don't want to be so down to earth or so lacking in religious attitude that we would say vomit instead of spit or spew. The Greek, the word that, the, that God chose to use is it's an explosive vomit that he will vomit them. And it's, and it's not, but see, every teaching that I've ever heard, every teaching that I've ever done in this, I just talk about how, how God is just, this church makes him sick to his stomach. But when I was praying about this, it dawned on me. It's not just that an attitude that he has, this is his body violently rejecting and expelling impurity from it. Vomiting is not, this is not voluntary. It's not a voluntary action. No. It's not like you say, well, I think I'll vomit. I'll make a decision to vomit, which is what some of the translations seem to say. What, what he is saying is, if there's impurity in his body, his body is going to violently toss it out. Toss it out, reject it. Now, in order for it to have been in there in the first place, it had to come by the gift of Jesus Christ into a right relationship with him. These, the church, the people in the church later to see it, there's still a chance. That's why he's standing at the door knocking, trying to get their attention, because he's still crying out to them. There is a last opportunity for them to, to, to turn from what they're doing and turn to them. That's, by the way, called repentance. The King James, as I said, says spew. The NASB says spit. You've got to understand that Christ, his body, will reject compromised Christianity. And I said that the Sermon on the Mount is about removing compromised Christianity from our lives and from our midst. I've said over and over and over, over 35 years I've been talking about the Sermon on the Mount, that it is the most radical, fanatical sermon ever preached. It is certainly the most lengthy and complete sermon, one sermon that Jesus ever preached. But it shouldn't be radical and fanatical in the sense that we use it. Because while it may not be common in Christianity, what's taught in the Sermon on the Mount, it is normal Christianity. This is what Jesus said, the Sermon on the Mount, all of these teachings. Because remember, this teaching, it says, you know, I'll go back to that, that scripture I quoted before from Paul to Timothy. This is 2 Timothy 3.16. He says, All Scripture is God-breathed. That's what it says, God-breathed. And profitable for, for teaching, for correction, for reproof, for training in righteousness. What the Sermon on the Mount is, early on in the public ministry of Jesus, right after he has called his apostles and he's gathered his disciples, what he is doing now with the Sermon on the Mount is training them in righteousness. If... Righteousness was a free gift to us. We were made right with God the Father as a gift. Jesus Christ, his shed blood on that cross, carried into the Holy of Holies. But we have to walk in that righteousness. We have to live that righteousness. The Sermon on the Mount, from, from Matthew 5, 1 to the end of chapter 7, that is training in righteousness, how we are to live this righteousness. The Sermon on the Mount should be our normal Christianity. It should be, it is the test of whether we are walking in righteousness or not walking in righteousness. It is the test of whether or not there is impurity in our life. And you spoke yesterday about the people who are drinking and then they become alcoholics. Right. When they first start drinking, their body rejects oh, yeah. because it is a poison. It is a, right. 
Uh, I, yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely true. I, you know, for uh, and a really good example is, um, and if you're younger than me, and almost everybody is, you know, this may not be as understandable to you, but I, I smoked for years. And I started smoking when I was a young teenager. But at the time I started smoking, that was common in our culture. I mean, you know, people weren't saying that smoking was bad. By and large, people were saying that smoking was good, right? And it was really a bad thing. And I can remember, and anybody who smoked should be able to remember this. The first time you picked up a cigarette oh and puffed on it, you had to overcome that. Yes. You had to overcome that because it was horrible. But because of the peer pressure, because of the pressure to fit in, to it's fit into cool. the culture, you know, you, you overcame, you got past that horror, and you got better at it. Yes. You became accustomed Practice. to it. You practiced. Practice. Yeah. Uh, I have a problem with anybody that shows me a drink, for example, or a food, and says, well, you know, you, it's, a, it's a, a, a developed taste. Why you to develop a taste for it? Yeah. Hey, if it doesn't taste good the first time, forget about it. Get it out of here. Ching, gone out. You know, I shouldn't have to develop a taste. I shouldn't have to learn to like something. It's either it's either good or it's not good. Well, the, the problem is, then once you start smoking, oh my goodness, what a hard thing to get rid of and out of your life. Because that thing that started off hard becomes a part of you. Becomes a part of you and becomes so incredibly difficult to get rid of. Well, that's true of sin in our lives. When we tolerate sin in our lives and we allow it, you know, when you're first saved, and you know, it's like, oh man, you just don't want sin in your life. No, everything is. But then maybe you just, you know, start to let a little thing it. in and tolerate it. Well, you know, everybody, everybody, where everybody's doing this, it's so. And then the next thing you know, you don't even know you're doing it. Or when you do recognize it, well, everybody's doing it, and it becomes so difficult to deal with. We have to become, uh, let me rephrase this. We live in a world and in a time when one of the great graces is to be tolerant. Tolerant of this and tolerant of that. And one of the great sins in the world, according to the world, is intolerance. That's true. And you know, one of the, one of the worst things that people can call you is, or oh, you're intolerant. I'm intolerant because I have the mind of Christ. And may I become intolerant of sin, totally, completely, and absolutely intolerant of sin, in my life. Because if it doesn't start with your own life, if you don't become intolerant of sin in your own life, you have no right to be intolerant of sin in anybody else's life, I promise you that. And any time you become intolerant of sin in somebody else's life, it better be because you love them. And your purpose is to help them get away from that addiction that is deadly. But we need to become intolerant because God is intolerant to sin. Six things does the Lord hate, yea, even seven are an abomination. The church has become tolerant of way, way too much sin. We have, we have as much, if not more, divorce with inside, within the church than in the world. In spite of the fact that it is clearly written and should be taught that God hates divorce. Now, I don't sit here in condemnation, for there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But that doesn't mean we're going to tolerate. We want to deal with these things, because God has the power to correct. And he reproves, he disciplines those whom he loves. Okay, so just remember that lukewarm Christians are... Uh, read this and study this in, in Revelation chapter 3. Lukewarm Christians are an impurity in the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. A defilement mm -hmm. of the body of Christ and a danger to the body of Christ. And Jesus will, by design, violently expel them from the body, from his body, regardless of how ugly or uncomfortable it is. His body will be purged. Let, let me just say this again. The beginning was good. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning, God looked. He made everything. And he looked down and he said, it is good. And then Adam and Eve sinned. The impurity was there. 
Oh my goodness gracious, impurity. Yes. And your impurity, your sin, it says in Isaiah, separates you from God. That's why, you, that's why sin prevents you, unholiness, unrighteousness, impurity, prevents you from seeing God, because your sin separates you from God. And he, by the way, is not lost. He is not lost. If you're sinning, you are the one that's lost. But thank God that if, if, even if you, you know what? He said he would go out after the one. He'd leave the 99 sheep to go out after the one to find them when they get lost. His desire is for you. Okay. So anyhow, in the beginning it was good. Exact, exa let's examine the fact that when you came to new life in Christ Jesus, because before that you were walking dead in your transgressions, all right? Because sin is not only, not only separates you from God, it kills you. Because that's what death that is. Scripturally, it's separation from God. All right? So, when you started new life, that when God gave you that gift of new life, you started with a pure heart. That's, this is one of the most important things to know about what salvation is. It's removing that, that, well, you know what? Let me go to Ezekiel. And in Ezekiel chapter 36, it says this. For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. And then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness, and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart, and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone, and give you a heart of flesh. God is going to take out the old, old heart and give you a brand new heart. Why? Because he is taking that impure and giving you a new pure heart. A fresh start. Hallelujah. When we came forth from that death, when we came out of the tomb of death, we still came out wrapped with all the junk that we had accumulated in our natural life. You were made new on the inside. But, you know, if you got saved yesterday, you look the same in the mirror today as you did two days ago. It's not something that happens on the outside, although it should start what's happened God has done on the inside should radiate outward and change the outside. Don't I look cute, cuter than I used to? Yeah. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Well, the, the fact is, because... And again, this goes back to what is the Sermon on the Mount about? If God has given you new life, that should result in a new lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So that new heart, which is the core of your being, should radiate outwards and change the way you look on the outside. And yes, I'm going to say that it will actually change the way you look. You may still be the same height, you may still be the same weight, but the fact of the matter is there will be a glow right. that is visible on the outside that you never had before. People because you will, are, you, you know, know people what? People will know it. I mean, they'll see it. There is the fruit of the whole, you look at an orange tree, mm -hmm. right? And then you, as Alice and I were down in Naples, Florida not long ago, going down to visit somebody in the hospital there. And traveling along this route that we, we normally take, Route 27, it's all orange groves down in the south part of that. And one of the first things you notice is whether there's fruit on the limbs or not. Mm -hmm. right? The fruit becomes very, very evident on, right. on the orange tree. Well, the fruit should be evident in our lives. The oranges don't, can't take any credit for this. It's the tree that did the work. Okay? And in the same way, Jesus said, how will you know them? Uh, this is, by the way, in the, sermon, the end of the Sermon on the Mount. He said, you'll know them by their fruit. Well, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and you can go check this out in Paul's letter to the Church of Galatia, is, you know, the, the love, the joy, the peace, the gentleness, the patience, the self-control, the kindness. You can go, go look at that. But the fact is, that joy should radiate from you. God's love should radiate in you. I mean, it should change the look on your face. That joy should change your, countenance. turn your frown upside down and put a smile on your face. But the fact of the matter is, you have reason. You're supposed to be giving thanks in all things. That becomes visible in your life. And what a wonderful thing it is. What a wonderful thing it is. So God's intention was that the new inside will now change the old outside. The danger is that we will let the old outside change the new inside. 
When Lazarus, when Jesus stood in front of a tomb, the tomb of a man four days dead, and cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus did indeed come forth. But he came forth still wrapped in the death cloth that they used to bury people at the time. And the first thing that Jesus said was unbind him. Get that stuff off of him. That, that death cloth, those grave clothes, those, that clothing of death, that garment of death, is the old traditions and habits that we had prior to new life in Christ Jesus. You've got to get rid of it. Because that impurity on the outside will affect the inside. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. Get rid of it. Start living this new lifestyle that is def defined in the Sermon on the Mount. Okay. It's a process. It is a process. It's a process that starts with a decision. So I, I should, it starts with a command. A command that requires a decision. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Rome. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, he said, Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We have to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. This is how the Word of God becomes that purging, pur to purge out the impurities out of our life. Because when we abide in the Word, what happens is it starts to push those impurities out. It's the living waters. So and that's how, so right. So it is. You're cleansed by the living waters. But it's, what's, what's happening is that transformation of your mind is those impurities being pushed out by training in righteousness. Right? So, but you've got to recognize that there is a battle. Paul talks about a constant battle between the flesh and the spirit that, that rages in our lives. Okay, so it's not, nobody said it's an easy task, and I've said right from the beginning, it's not a pleasant task. Remember when I talked about, here he goes again, a colonoscopy, and I said you had to be cleansed. That's not a pleasant thing, but it's a necessary thing. Well, grow up. It's time for the church to recognize that there are things, they, as we may consider them unpleasant, but they're necessary. And it may be unpleasant to deal with those things in your own life that you know shouldn't be in your own life. But you better make the decision to do it. We're getting too accustomed to comfort. We we are. We are accustomed to comfort, mm -hmm. and it's it, it is easier to compromise right. than it is to confront. And the fact of the matter is, we need that confrontation, where our spirit confronts our our flesh and says, "We're not going to make it. We're not going to. We're not going to either declare a ceasefire." We're not going to have an interim... We, I'm at war with you, right. and I'm going to win. That's right. Okay. Religion is not the answer. No. If, if anything, I promise you that the Sermon on the Mount is a treatise against religion. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is a perfect picture of religion versus righteousness. Now, when I talk about religion, I'm not, I'm not talking about religion as God defines it, pure and undefiled in the first chapter of James. I'm talking about religion as we know it and as the Pharisees practiced it even 2,000 years ago. It's outward acts. And that's over and over in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus, he is portraying religion. He says, you have heard it. And he talks about what the Pharisees are doing. And he says, but I say to you, and here is the righteous way. So you got religion versus righteousness. Choose to live righteously. Because religion can't purify you. Well, even when you were talking about that, how Jesus spoke to the Pharisees, right. I was looking at Matthew in uh, 23, 26, when he said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed, whitewashed tombs, tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Right. So it's like having all this impurity, but just putting a nice cover on it. Right. You see... The, the law can't cure sin. The law never could cure sin. It can only point to the cure for sin. Paul wrote to the Galatians and he said this, Before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we might be justified by faith. The law doesn't, the law can't remove sin. 
It points to your sin. But then it points to salvation from your sin. It's a tutor that leads us to Christ. So as Christ commanded that the wrappings be removed from Lazarus, we, we've got to remove those now in us. And this is why what, what you wear, and I've been to a lot of, I've preached and I've shared and I've fellowshiped in a lot of holiness churches around the world who have a very clear-cut, well-defined dress code. Does dress matter when it comes to holiness, purity, sanctification? I'm here to tell you absolutely it does. And I want to give you the scripture for that. Okay, so you might make a note of this one. Okay. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now faith has come. We are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized in Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. It matters what you wear. You better put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You better put on that whole armor of God. What you wear matters. But I'll tell you what, it's not the robes of the Pharisees. It's a garment of praise. So, this is God's plan. But the devil, he's got a plan. Always. And he's got a partner in his plan. Who's the partner? Our old flesh. Shut up, flesh. Okay. Our flesh now, now wants the old outside to pollute the new inside, just like the devil does. Let me give you an example from here in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5. 27. This is just an example. And we're, by the way, we're going to get to this one of these days. You have heard that it was said, Jesus said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. It's about pure in heart. God searches the heart. He spoke to the prophet Samuel oh so many thousands of years ago. And say, man judges by outward appearance, but I, the Lord, search the heart. Religion concerned itself, still does, with outer actions, but Christ, the inward. This is Mark 7. And he was saying, this is Jesus, and Jesus was saying, that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of man, Proceed evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these things proceed from within and defile the man. These are things we have to make sure we don't allow into our heart, or we have to find out how to get them purged. Now, it's, I, there's one thing I, I do want to say here, because I think this is important. So there's therefore now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. I have done a lot of counseling over the last three and a half decades with guys, and, and because of this verse, Jesus said, I tell you, if you even look at a woman with lust, you've already committed adultery. And now guys say, oh my goodness gracious, because I'm going to tell you, it is normal for guys to look at pretty girls. Yes. Women, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. I'm not going to talk about pretty girls right now. Hey, my mama didn't raise no fool. But I use the example all the time of like sports cars. Because before I got saved, I loved sports cars. I've had a, quite a number of sports cars in my life before I got saved. I liked fast sports cars. So, if, if, a, if a Ferrari drives by me, as a matter of fact, Alice still, and I... You still like fast sports I, I still do. Well, that's my point. Yeah. When we were... Alice and I were driving someplace the other day, and we were in traffic, and as we were driving by, a Ferrari pulled up alongside me, and I looked over, and oh, that was a pretty Ferrari, i got to tell you the truth, it really was. So I looked at that Ferrari, that's not sin. There's no sin in looking. And I actually, I like that Ferrari. There's no sin, no sin there. Liking. Jesus didn't say looking at the woman is a sin. He said looking with lust is a sin. 
Lust, not looking, is the same. And lust is a process. I looked at that Ferrari, and I, I, and I liked that Ferrari. But then I chose not to linger. I didn't let my mind linger on that Ferrari, because my mind is set on the things above. So that was enough. I looked at the Ferrari, I liked that Ferrari, and I turned my mind and got, that was the end of that. The danger comes when you let your mind linger on something. Because if I had lingered on that Ferrari, then you get to the place where, whoa, boy, wouldn't I look good behind that wheel? Wouldn't that look good in my garage? And you start thinking about that, and the next thing you know, you are lusting for that thing. You want it. You look, you like, you linger, you lust. We are called by Paul to take thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. So, you know, stop the process. It's, that's the whole deal. There's nothing wrong with looking at something that's pretty, that's beautiful. But, you know, and obviously you're going to like it. If you don't know that men like pretty women, you ain't paying attention. The problem becomes when they let their minds linger on these things, and that lingering then becomes lust. That's the problem. And that's sin. No matter how you cut it, no matter how you look at it, we live in a world filled with pollution and filth, spiritually. And we have to learn to control, to put on this helmet of salvation and take thoughts captive and control. It's all right. There's a lot of things out there that God has created that are beautiful. I mean, sunsets and sunrises and mountains and, and the ocean. You know what? We're not, we're not supposed to even like the world or the things in the world. James wrote and said, if you, love, if you like the world and the things of the world, you have not the love of the Oh, that was John. James takes it further and says, if you like the world, make yourself a friend of the world. You've made yourself an enemy of God. But that doesn't mean you can't look at pretty sunsets. So, you know, God has given you the word to guide you. And in that word, that's what it talks about. There's, there's a process. You're allowed to look, but don't let that turn into lust. As a matter of fact, if you, if you like it, guys, you know what? One of the things that happens, if you look at, at pretty women out there, and you let your mind go off in the direction it shouldn't go, you're never going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, because that's never going to be your concern. And the other thing you've got to remember is that God built that in men, because it is not good for the man to be alone. So he yeah. has to oh, have yeah, this, that in yeah. there. So he yeah. can find but I'm just saying, you know, don't get condemned. Understand the difference between looking at something and lusting for right. something, all right? Okay. Um, because the fact of the matter is we live in a world filled with pornography. I, it is incredible to me how impure this world is. It, and it becomes more and more impure by the day. But that, you know, it's not, I said it's like, it's kind of like, you can't be in the world today and not see pornography. Isaiah wrote, this is going back 2,700, more than 2,700 years ago, and, and in Isaiah 24, um, uh, verse 5, it says that the whole earth, the earth is polluted by the transgressions of men. For they have transgressed the laws, violated statutes, and broken the everlasting covenant. God sees sin as that pollutant, right? As that, now, you know, the Supreme Court here in the United States of America made a decision some time back quite a while back. It was 1973. And uh, in, in a Supreme Court case, Justice Berger announced the definition of obscenity. And he, the, the American government defines obscenity as something that the average person applying contemporary community standards would find that the work taken as a whole appeals to purient interest. In other words, what defines pornography is whether it's acceptable to the community or not acceptable to the community. That's a lie straight from the pits of hell. Pornography is what is, a, what is not acceptable to God. That's what defines pornography. It's not acceptable to God. And a lot of the stuff that we tolerate, that we have grown to tolerate, that we are no longer even seeing, that we're oblivious to, is pornography to God. We don't even recognize it. If you do not get that purity in heart, you will not see God. Okay. It was the Spirit of God that gave us this new and pure heart. When we fall short and defile it, we must 
like David, a man after God's own heart, cry out to the Lord in repentant surrender and trust in His ability to purify it. Okay? You need help when it's time to get cleansed. Okay? After David had committed adultery with Bathsheba, now, if you don't know the story, you can go back. It's in 2 Samuel and you can read about it, right? Uh, in 2 Samuel 12, it talks about the fact that Dan, David, a man after God's own heart, allowed impurity into his life. He looked at a woman, Bathsheba. He liked what he saw, but then he lingered. He kept on looking, and he began to lust, and his lust led to action. Lust always leads to action, by the way. And he took that woman, that married woman, and had relations with her. Adultery. God don't like no adultery. And after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba, David caused the death of her husband, Uriah, who was one of his most loyal and trusted generals. But in order to cover his own sin, because we always try and hide our sin, David caused Uriah to be killed in battle. Now, I've mentioned this verse a couple of times. Paul wrote to Timothy and said that the Word of God, all Scripture, God breathed, is profitable for, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Mm -hmm. So God, in His wonderful grace, sent His Word to David. He sent the Word in the form of Nathan the prophet. Right. And Nathan the prophet, with the boldness of a prophet, confronted David in his sin. And you know what? David responded to God's loving discipline with a heartfelt cry of repentance. That's the tool that is provided by God for catharsis, for purification. And it's the only tool that I know of. It's called repentance. And repentance will violently expel, true repentance will violently expel that impurity from your life. If you go to Psalm 51, and read it. And please do. Let this be your homework assignment for the week. Read, study, meditate upon, and pray about Psalm 51. Because this is God's instruction on how to find that purity of heart. When David cried out, I'll just read the beginning. He said, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness. And he prayed, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. He prayed, Purify me. He prayed, Create in me a clean heart. And, you know, it's interesting because that word that, that, that's used in there, wash me thoroughly, that, that is not the word for washing, it's not the Hebrew word that's used for washing a body. Mm -hmm. That's the Hebrew word that was used for trampling cloth. Because, now we lived in Central America, we've seen this in, in there, we've seen it in Africa, where they take clothing down that's, in, that's dirty and literally beat it on rocks. Why? To get the impurities out. It's not about adding bleach, it's about beating the impurities out. So that Hebrew word that's used there is about expelling the dirt, the impurity from it. So, so remember that in the definition of a, a pure, it said, one of the things it said was extraneous. Now extraneous things, that's the things that don't seem bad to us. They're just extra. And they're unnecessary. They're unnecessary because they're not part of God's purpose or plan in and for our lives. And not necessarily bad. They're just not part of what God wants in our life. Like I said in the very beginning, and I've said it a couple of times, this sermon, the teaching of Jesus, is radical and fanatical. But it's consistent. Again, I want to, I'm going to read now that verse from James. This is James 4.4. 4. You adulteresses, Speaking to the church. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Not my message. Father, I just pray that in repentance we 
we turn and fix our eyes on your Son, Christ Jesus, the only one who can redeem us and cleanse us from our sins. Father, that we would be purified, that it would be the burden, the joy, and the desire of our hearts is to be pure in heart that we might see you, that we would see you in every situation in our lives. That's my prayer.